first lecture is called In Praise of Something. Quote something. Ontology is the theory of what there is. To understand what ontology is, therefore, we must understand the phrase what there is, which points to the question, what is there? Obviously, if someone were asked this question out of the blue, he would not know what to make of it, unless he were a philosopher. For philosophers carry around with them a context or ambience in which otherwise startling questions are relevant and at home. In this case, however, even if we are in a philosophical mood, we cannot help but be puzzled by this question if we linger on it for a moment and don't rush on to specific issues in ontology. At this point, I might discuss the grammar of what questions in general or call attention to the fact that in ordinary contexts, we would feel the question to be incomplete, expecting some such continuation as, what is there which has 12 pairs of legs in each chicken? In, instead, I will make the obvious point that when the uh, ontologist who asks this question, if he ever does, uh, he is concerned with kind. As is so often the case, a grammatical, a grammatical singular at the surface carries, uh, uh, conceals plurality in the depths. On the other hand, a paraphrase of the, uh, of the question, of the initial question as what kinds of thing are there, would and should be met with resistance. Thus, an ontologist might well object that his concern is not with what kinds of thing there are, for this admits as answers names of kinds, thus lion kind, dragon kind. And although there might be, these might be of interest to him as a zoologist or mythologist, and on occasion even as a logician or philosopher, when as an ontologist he asks what is there, he is not looking for empty kinds, which is not to say that the kind empty kind, which is by no means empty, might not be of great interest. From his point of view, then, a more adequate paraphrase would be, what kinds are there such that there are things of that kind? Yet although this account has the virtue of leading eventually to such cases as there are lions, there are tame tigers, there are no dragons, it obviously begins at a high level of abstraction. As a matter of fact, it strikes us that our original question might as well have been, what are there? to which there are lions seems to be the direct answer. And if this answer is brushed aside by someone who asks, who cares qua ontologist if there are lions, or for that matter dragons, the following answers might well be forthcoming. There are numbers, there are classes, there are attributes, there are propositions, there are possible worlds, and so on. Or there are classes and classes of classes, but yes, there are no attributes. At this point, I might turn my attention to the classical distinction between ordinary kinds and categories. But instead of addressing myself directly to this topic, I prefer to have it take its own time in emerging in the course of these lectures. Yet today, I do want to plunge directly into ontological issues. Or to change metaphors, the ontological uh, dialogue uh, uh, plunge into the ontological dialogue which swirls around us with all the familiar twists and turns. It is my purpose to join the argument, but cagely to choose my moments in such a way as to display my views to their best advantage. I shall assume to start with, then, that, to make, that the way to make a direct ontological commitment to numbers is to say, in all candor, there are numbers. If I were to add, quote, or something which can reasonably be, par be said to entail the statement, end quote, I would, of course, have opened Pandora's box, and we are not yet quite ready for that. Thus, I focus attention to begin with on the form there are Ks, where K represents a sortal or count noun. I shall also uh, assume that to use an example, there are lions can be paraphrased as something is a lion. I shall not, however, draw upon the paraphrase, lions exist, not because it doesn't, at least in some contexts, serve this purpose, but because the verb to exist is a slippery one and has uses which belong in quite different contexts and raise quite different problems. My general strategy will be to draw attention, draw a distinction between a sense of philosophically interesting questions of the form, 
there are Ks, for example, there are attributes, to which the appropriate answer is, so to speak, a truistic yes. Of course there are attributes. Of course there are qualities. Of course there are relations. And a sense in which the answer, whether yes or no, is highly con controversial. This second sense can be phrased in traditional philosophical style, are there really attributes? Though just what the burden of really is part of the longer story. You may be put in mind of Carnap's distinction between internal and external questions, but this is not what I have in mind, although it is not unrelated, and I shall have something to say about that distinction at a later stage in the argument. I've implied that it is, in a sense, a truism to say that there are classes, attributes, numbers, propositions, possibilities, etc. What is not truistic is, in the spirit of G.E. Moore, the analysis of these truisms. Thus, are attributes analyzable into or reducible to items belonging to another and presumably non-abstract kind? Or to use a more uh, contemporary turn of phrase, are statements about attributes paraphrasable? in a philosophically interesting way in terms of statements about non-abstract entities. Can we regiment discourse about attributes without losing our ability to say what we want to say, to say what will serve our purposes? Only as a last resort would I consent to expunge discourse about attributes from my vocabulary. It may turn out to have more shorthand cousins more shorthand cousins who can do all the work it really does, but appearances are what give point to life, even for the philosopher. And I know that even that lover of desert landscapes, Klein, enjoys them all the more because of his geographer's knowledge of the jungle. To return <laughs> to the main thread, it will be useful to make a terminological commitment and so use the term object and classify that such a statement as Tom is a man would be said to refer to an object and classify it as a man. I remind you that I am focusing attention on the form X is a K. I might have used the more general form X is phi, where phi can represent either a sortal or an adjectival predicate, or even phi X, where phi can even represent a verb. But the varieties of predication, or what is called predication, and the varieties of use given to the complex, to the copula, are so manifold that it will be good strategy to cut them down to size uh, where, the, where it promises even temporary advantage. Notice that by stipulating a use for object, I make it possible to reserve entity for a different, if related, role. How then are we to understand something is a lion? Clearly, it doesn't refer to uh, a selected object, yet it has something to do with objects. If we reflect that the statement in question is true, if and only if some object or other is a lion, we may be tempted to say that in, the context, in this context, something makes an indefinite or indeterminate reference to objects. Uh, well, not in the way everything is a lion does, Yet in its own way, it doesn't leave any out to all objects. Well, not in the way everything is a lion does, yet in its own way, it doesn't leave any out. If asked to explain this indeterminate reference to all objects, there are two general lines we might take. The first of which divides into two, each of which points hopefully to the other. A, the general line of the first strategy is to argue that the referential character of something is derivative from the referential character of determinate references, say names and demonstratives. Now, to this general strategy A, there is a first form, A1. The first and rather forlorn substrategy is to equate something is a lion with Leo is a lion or Nixon is a lion or Goldwater is a lion or Gibraltar is a lion, perhaps the number three is a lion or etc. 
This line, though not without its temptations, runs into familiar roadblocks. The et cetera is doing an awful lot of unexplained work. Uh, as Miss Anscombe points out, the et cetera, or dots which might replace it, is not the et cetera of laziness. Yet when we reflect on the different ways in which something and everything refer indeterminately to all objects, we are bound to feel that or and and have something to do with the distinction. The second, A2, and more lively substrategy under A, returns to the theme of the truth conditions for something is a lion. You remember uh, that something is a lion, roughly, is true if and only if, uh, some object or other is a lion. But now, uh, return, we interpret it rather along uh, a familiar line Something as a lion is true if and only if some statement which makes a determinate reference to an object and classifies it as a lion is true. I formulate it in this way to stress its attempt to explain indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. This substrategy has the advantage of not pretending that we can actually come up with a list of determinate references, which would be necessary to yield something in some sense equivalent to the original statement, let alone synonymous with it. But while the second form of the first strategy has this advantage, it has troubles of its own. Statements are made in a language, and the resources of any natural language are always limited, certainly with respect to determinate referring expressions. Thus, A2 cannot con uh, construe the force of some statement which makes a determinate reference to an object in terms of a specified list of expressions um, in, um, in actual usage. Thus, it, is not, it must rely on the fact that a language is not what it is at any one time, not even what is, uh, its resources are not even what is available, no, not actually used at a time, but in a sense difficult to define the resources which the language could be extended and uh, by which the language could be extended in specific ways. It is this notion of the extendability of a language which makes it possible for the second substrategy under A for explaining indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference uh, possible. Of course, there's a more seriously serious difficulty uh, which arises when we uh, consider the fact that the domain of objects uh, includes real numbers, for example. It is, however, uh, it is presumably axiomatic that all extensions of a language contain at most a denumerable infinity of determinate referring expressions. An assessment of this difficulty must await an explanation of the sense in which numbers are objects. But what is the alternative? You see, the first alternative is to make some attempt to explain the reference of something. In other words, indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. What's the alternative? It is, to my mind, a most puzzling one. Though its puzzling aspects are quietly passed over, indeed, I would say, swept under the rug by those who espouse it. For it amounts to nothing more nor less than the idea that the word something has a connection unmediated by determinate references with all objects. And uh, by connection, as will become evident, I mean a relationship in psycholinguistic terms. I've been discussing the issue in terms of the word something, but its bite remains when we transpose it into the language of the logicians. Thus, where something is a tiger and it is tame becomes uh, EX, X is a tiger and X is tame. I read it simply that way because uh, the readings are, of course, as I see it, 
uh, the source of philosophical puzzles here. EX, X is a tiger, and X is tame. The variable X is said to range over objects, but it is not clear what it is for a variable to range over objects. Is there a word world connection between variables and items in extra linguistic realm of lions and tigers? If so, and the answer must surely be yes, is this ranging, which is clearly the counterpart of the indeterminate reference of something, to be explicated in terms of determinate reference, or is it to be taken as a basic mode of reference? Now, I have no objection whatever to a logician treating the concept of indeterminate reference as an unanalyzed concept in logical theory. <coughs> But its explication confronts the philosophical logician as a challenge which should not be ignored and will not go away. In formal semantics, one may, in a sense, explain the indeterminate reference of a statement, for example, EX, X is a lion, in the object language of which one is giving the semantics, as one says, by giving its truth conditions in an appropriate meta-language. For example, EX, quote, EX, X is a lion, end quote, in language L, and is true if and only if EX, X satisfies, single quote, X is a lion, close single quote, in L. Or to capture certain formal problems, EX, X is a series, and the series satisfies, single quote, X is a lion, close single quote, in L. Where we now consider infinite series of objects. But it leaps to the eyes that the problem of the nature of indeterminate reference has simply been transferred to the meta-language. I don't say that this isn't where it belongs. Indeed, strategy A2 made a parallel move. But when it gave the truth conditions of something as a lion in the meta-language, it did so with reference to statements of determinate reference in the object language and did not simply repeat indeterminate reference. It at least attempted to come to grips with the problem. The above, quote, explication, end quote, of indeterminate reference in terms of truth conditions simply postpones it. Even if one restricts the range of something to individuals in space and time, the puzzle is acute. It becomes particularly obtrusive when the claim is made that the referential character of proper names can be regimented as the referential character of descriptive phrases, the latter being traced in turn to the referential character of something, as when Plato is construed as, quote, the student of Socrates and teacher of Aristotle, end quote. And this in turn is construed in context in terms of something is uniquely a student of Socrates and teacher of Aristotle. Uh, for, for example, when Nixon is, quote, Nixon is construed as the Nixonizer, and this in turn is construed in connection with particular contexts in terms of something uniquely Nixonizes. <laughs> as I have already indicated, it seems obvious to me that expressions with successful determinate reference are connected with the extralinguistic world. Thus, Plato with a Greek philosopher, and, quote, Nixon with that man in the White House. On the view we are considering, this connection is to be interpreted, on the view we are considering, remember, you might say the orthodox view, uh, this connection is to be interpreted as a focusing of the connection between something and objects in general on a particular object by means of one or more predicates which pick out the term, which pick it out. Uh, for example, a predicate student of Socrates, teacher of Aristotle. Determinate reference is the focusing of indeterminate reference. Quine tells us that variables of quantification are the bearers of reference. In traditional terms, something, the word something, is the bearer of reference. I am simply asking that this be taken seriously and an account given of how variables of quantification, of how the word something 
hooks up with the world. Remember that I am not objecting to the concept of determinate, uh, the, the concept of indeterminate reference. Indeterminate reference cannot be avoided, except perhaps by God, who has a name for the sparrow which falls. The problem is how the concept of such reference is to be explicated. Neither of the strategies we have considered dispenses with quantification. For both, the word sum is used in the explication of, indeterminate re of the indeterminate reference of something in something is a lion. In the first strategy, it appears in some statement which makes a determinate reference to an object and classifies it as a lion is true. In the second, it appears in uh, EX, X satisfies single quote X is a lion and X is a lion, quote X is a lion is true of X, which uh, corresponds to something satisfies quote X is a lion and quote or X is a quote X is a lion close quote is true of something. So the, the concept of some and the notion of something is indispensable but it, as I said it's the challenge is to explain its connection with extra linguistic reality. Now some philosophers have tended to overlook this problem because in dealing with formalized languages, the resources of which are recursively specified by an effective procedure, they use a concept of reference which is not that of a connection between expressions and items in the world, though it is, in an interesting sense, parasitical upon it. They use a concept which is defined in purely logical terms. Thus, X refers to Y, all hyphenated, in a certain language, equals by definition. X equals, quote, New York in L, and Y equals New York, or X equals, quote, Chicago in L, and Y equals Chicago, or X equals, quote, Nixon in L, and Y equals Nixon, or, 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 or. Such a defined notion, as I pointed out in my paper for the Carnap volume some 20 years ago, is useful in constructing a recursive account of the semantical properties of the expressions of a formalized language but they no more explicate the concept of reference than X is the Dutch uncle of Y equals by definition, X equals Mr. Jones and Y equals Tom, or X equals Mr. Smith and Y equals Dick, or X equals Mr. Roberts and Y equals Harry, explicates what it is to be a Dutch uncle. The puzzle of indeterminate reference becomes truly formidable when the concept of reference is extended to abstract objects, thus attributes, classes, classes of classes, numbers, propositions, etc. How one wants to know, does the word something connect up with them? Here, however, the tension is heightened by the fact that even the concept of determinate reference to an abstract entity is problematic. Thus, in the case of non-abstract objects, there is at least the hope of explaining indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. But in the case of abstract objects, construed in the classical manner as non-reducible to non-abstract objects, how is determinate reference to be understood? Surely if, as is surely the case, the English word triangularity refers to the abstract object triangularity, there must be a psycholinguistic connection between the word and the object. Notice that it won't do to grant the general point that the word triangularity has a psycholinguistic connection with something, but argue that it is with triangular things. For triangularity is neither constituted by nor identical with any collection of triangular things and could be uh, referred to as readily if there were no triangular things. The classical Platonist was perfectly content to speak of real relations between forms and persons. He was willing to use the language of vision and of intercourse. He was, uh, Plato's forms made themselves known to us by acting on our minds. And if the concept of a cause which does not change in the course of causing 
is a puzzling one. At least uh, it was a serious, it represents a serious attempt to deal with a serious problem. In Neoplatonism, this causation became the agency of God. But the concept of the illumination of the mind was essentially the, essentially the same. Platonists believed themselves aware of experiencing the forms, but they also thought that their influence, whether we were aware of it or not, was necessary to explain how we could think of the world as we do and how we could know mathematical, ethical, and metaphysical truths. Many philosophers who have an ontology which includes irreducible abstract objects have felt uncomfortable about the idea of a causal relation between these objects and persons. They have contented themselves with the term awareness. We are aware of universals. We are aware of classes. We are aware of classes of classes of attributes and the rest. Uh, whether awareness is considered as an act, as a relation, or a tie, it is a connection in the spirit of our challenge. I suspect, however, that when metaphors and mysteries in which the concept of awareness are shrouded are spelled out, something like the platonic theme of causal efficacy will be found at the core. After all, traditional concepts of awareness, at least as recently as Moore, were based on the analogy of vision. And can vision be understood without causality? Now, many contemporary, uh, many contemporary Platonists and philosoph Platonic philosophers of mathematics are uh, aware of uh, the, this implication that is necessary, uh, as I see it, to deal with the problem of the uh, reference of uh, names of abstract singular terms to abstract entities. Uh, now, for example, uh, the, the classical theme here is uh, in, to be found in, uh, uh, in Diogenes of Sinope, uh, uh, reported by Diogenes Laertius, uh, who is said to have, to have reacted to such notions as seeing and being aware of and having intercourse with real being with the scoffing remark, table and cup I see, but your tablehood and cuphood, Plato, I nowhere see. That's readily accounted for, said Plato, for you have the eyes to see the visible table and cup, but not the understanding by which ideal tablehood and cuphood are discerned. <laughs> and a recent formulation of the Platonic thesis, which is the more valuable, and it is taken from a paper by one of the central figures in the current controversy, over abstract entities is as explicit as one could wish. And this is a quote from Alonzo Church. The extreme demand for a simple prohibition of abstract entities under all circumstances perhaps arises from a desire to maintain the connection between theory and observation. But the preference of, say, seeing over understanding as a method of observation seems to me capricious. For just as an opaque a body may be seen, so a concept may be understood or grasped. And the parallel between the two cases in, is indeed rather close. In both cases, the observation is not direct, but through intermediaries. Light, lenses of eye, or optical instruments in the one case, and the retina, and linguistic expressions in the case of the concept. Now there, Alonzo Church recognizes that if one is seriously going to put on abstract entities in one's ontology, one does need to have something like a psycholinguistic connection between language and these objects. Now, in my essay in the Carnap volume, I referred to above, I made the point that a semantical theory which finds a genuine place for abstract entities would have to recognize psycholinguistic relationships between these entities and persons. Carnap denied this, of course. But his denial simply mobilized the theme that in the case of abstract entities, for example, numbers, x designates in g y equals, by definition, x equals uh, eins, the German word eins, and y equals one. Or x equals the German word psi, and y equals the number two etc., etc., or, 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 or. But as in the case of non-abstract objects, such a concept of designates in L, defined by a listing, 
no more explicates the connection between number words and numbers as classically conceived as non-linguistic objects than it, than it explains the connection between the word, quote, Chicago and the Windy City. Philosophers have a peculiar <clears throat> form of the Midas touch. Everything they touch becomes a puzzle <laughs> and eventually a problem. The concept of reference, and particularly of indeterminate reference, is certainly no exception. I have touched it, and speaking for myself, at least, have encountered the problem of how language and objects are related. I began by assuming that in the case of ordinary objects, at least determinate reference involves a real relation between these objects and the expressions which refer to them. I did not mean to imply that there is nothing problematic about this connection. Uh, indeed, it has long been my con conviction that it is one of the key problems of philosophy. And in some of my writings, I have attempted to show that, not, that only a thoroughly naturalistic philosophy of mind can solve it. One of my purposes in these lectures is to clarify and expand these attempts and to make, more pers make them more persuasive than they have proved to be. In addition to touching on the problem of indeterminate reference, which, though surely central to contemporary discussions of ontological issues, uh, which, though surely central to contemporary discussions of ontological issues, remains behind the scenes and needs to be smoked out, I've also touched on the topic of determinate reference to abstract objects, though I've pursued it just far enough to introduce you to my perplexities. Sooner or later, I shall return, of course, to the topic of abstract entities and how we refer to them. But before I do so, I wish to call attention once more to the versatility of the word something. As I, the lecture is entitled, In Praise of Something, and I have just begun to justify this name. <clears throat> I shall introduce the next point without, elaborate, without the elaborate dialectic with which I introduced it and defended it some 17 years ago when I was also writing an essay on ontology. It's called Grammar and Existence, uh, Preface to Ontology. It is to the effect that in ordinary language we can not only generalize from Tom is tall to something is tall, but also from Jones is pale and Smith is also pale to Jones is something and Smith is also it. And from Jones is a professor and Smith is also a professor to Jones is a something and Smith is also an it. And even though I shall not argue the point from if Jones comes then there will be trouble to if something then there will be trouble. Thus something can be used in contexts in which it replaces an adjective, context in which it replaces a sortal, and context in which it replaces a sentence. As I said, I'm giving this sort of boldly here because uh, um, it uh, otherwise would uh, require some nice examples of dialogues in ordinary language, and of course we want to get right down to the analytic heart of it. Thus, uh, uh, it will be useful for our purposes to use a terminology in which the word corresponding to something contains an indication of the grammatical category of the determinate expressions it replaces. By the way, the scholastics were very well aware of the, uh, the unique and, uh, um, uh, and wide-ranging role of aliquid. Uh, I mean, you could, we could, uh, the history of logic is, is full of perceptions on the topic that I am discussing today. The role of something that I've been talking about uh, uh, is a topic which, uh, uh, as I said, has a venerable history, and uh, rightly so. Now I'm going to introduce this, a terminology, as I said, in which I'm going to use special variations on the word something. Thus, instead of 
Jones is something and Smith is also it, I will write, Jones is somehow and Smith is also it. Or Jones is somehow and Smith is that how. Strictly speaking, this is a bad choice because how is Jones would not normally be answered by Jones is pale or let alone Jones is tall. But I can think of nothing better unless we go, as I once did, uh, to the Latinate, sum quale. Jones is sum quale. Correspondingly, I shall use Jones is a some sort as the generalization from Jones is a philosopher. And following a suggestion stemming from Arthur Pryor, uh, if some that, there will be trouble. Now, the points I am about to raise and discuss have been put to use by philosophers of language influenced by Frege, particularly Peter Geech and more recently Michael Dummett in his monumental study of Frege. Now, after introducing these contrived uh, counterparts of something in the contexts uh, which I, with which I am concerned, I shall leave them in the background until the real philosophizing is to be done. Thus, I shall move immediately to a mode of representation by symbols. Thus, for Jones is somehow, and Smith is that how, I shall use EF, Jones is F, and Smith is also F. This is, this is uh, going to be our symbolese for our contrived, somewhat contrived uh, sentence. Jones is somehow, and Smith is that how. Now, there is no surface reason to think that the first of these ways of speaking, Jones is hum somehow, and Smith is that how, makes an explicit ontological commitment. Uh, though it can be paraphrased as Jones is something and Smith is also it. For it does not have the form something is a K or there are Ks, which we have taken to be our paradigm of ontological commitment. And if we put it as Jones is somehow and Smith is that how, we must be careful not to split up somehow, we have Jones is somehow, and Smith is also that how. We must be very careful not to split up somehow into some how. Uh, this will this has will have a little sting to it, which will appear uh, in my next lecture. Uh, nor should we separate that how into that how. For this might, uh, might lead us to construe how as a sorbel. Jones is some how. And move from Jones is some how and Smith is that how to there is a how such that Jones is it and Smith is it, and from there to there are hows. <laughs> An ontological commitment to hows. Perhaps further argument will lead us to the idea that there are hows, or something like hows, but we should uh, not beg the question to begin with. I mean, I, I think the idea that there are hows is a pleasant one. <laughs> uh, but uh, we may, in the last analysis, uh, have to withdraw our compliments from them. I should equally have warned against reading something as some thing. For this leads to the temptation to construe the X in EX, X is a tiger, as though it were the sort of thing or object, and to read the formalism, there is an object, and uh, such that it is a tiger. 
If now we look at the symbolic representation, EF, Jones is F, and Smith is also F, we might be tempted to think of the F as a restricted variable. Thus, instead of representing, and I'll give you an example of a restricted variable, instead of representing some cows, some crows are black, as EX, X is a crow and X is black, we might, if we had a simple-minded interest in crows, uh, really a single-minded interest in crows, use the variable small c and simply say, EC, C is black. Or in the case of numbers, if we have a single-minded interest in numbers, we might, instead of saying EX, X is a number and X is divisible by three, we might say EN, N is divisible by three. Thus, somebody who approaches this from that direction and uh, with certain other, uh, what shall I say, bees buzzing around, in his bonnet, might think that EF, F, Jones is F, is a restricted form of EX. X is an attribute and Jones has X, which would, on our assumptions, correspond to there is an attribute, such that Jones has it, which makes explicit ontological reference commitment to attributes. Notice that I am assuming that attributes are had or exemplified by objects. If so, we have a direct conflict between the logical form of the unquantified statement with which we began, namely Jones is pale, and that of its quantified counterpart thus interpreted, thus manhandled, there is an attribute such that Jones has it. There is, of course, another reason why one might think of the symbolic representation, if taken seriously, uh, attributes must be introduced as objects which things have are involved. Thus it might be argued that if we took the quantification seriously, we are led to the following truth condition. EF is Jones, we're thinking of a truth condition for that, and we might be led to the following. Remember this is Jones is somehow, a generalization from Jones is pale. Quote, EF, Jones is F, and quote in English is true if and only if for some x, x is an attribute and quote Tom has y close single quote is true of x. But though this biconditional is indeed true, it is not because a truth condition for this must be given in these terms, but simply because for every statement of the form Jones is f there is a corresponding statement, logically equivalent to it, but not synonymous with it, Jones has Fness. Thus, Jones is somehow, although logically equivalent to, there is an attribute which Jones has, is not synonymous with it. And this situation arises often in logic. We have, for example, snow is white, that snow is white is true. Now, this is logically equivalent to that snow, to that snow, is, to the snow is white, but it doesn't mean the same as it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it will turn out that the reason why these are logically equivalent and but not synonymous turn to be the same because it turns out that the concept of truth does come in to the concept of an attribute. Now, uh, I want to uh, wind up uh, the discussion for today, laying the groundwork for what I want to discuss uh, tomorrow. And indeed, to a Phrygian, this argument about truth conditions begs the question by assuming that truth conditions must be given in terms of objects. One can indeed be exclusively interested in interpretations of sentences in which quantifiers range over objects and indeed so use the phrase truth on an interpretation so that, that quantifiers must be interpreted as ranging over objects. But it is at least at first sight open to someone to distinguish between truth on an interpretation and truth period. We have already appealed to Carnap's principle of toleration, a more recent form of Joseph's, H.W.B. Joseph's plea for free thinking in logistics, a famous uh, series of articles in mind. And uh, we have demanded the right to use the full symbolic apparatus of quantification in connection with predicate variables. Uh, without assuming 
that either by explication or by considerations pertaining to truth conditions, we are led directly to an ontological commitment to attributes as objects which ordinary objects have. Now, uh, I think I'll stop there today because next time I want to discuss, begin to discuss the Frigian alternative, the notion, uh, putting it humorously, as I said, it's going to be the notion that there are hows. And I'm going to try to discuss how one gets to the idea that there are hows and whether one has to agree that there are hows and uh, what are we to do in get in place of hows. And uh, that is the menu. Well, we could stop for a few minutes if, for people who want to leave. Uh, Professor Sellers will conduct the discussion period following this in a few minutes. Yes. You uh, care to comment on the fine manner of dodging the problem you put up for him, uh, which is that a philosophical logician really ought to, ought not to leave the uh, referential character of, of uh, something unexplained. His manner of dodging it being, of course, to say, well, this is all subject to the indeterminacy of translation. Well, no, that, that, isn't, that doesn't avoid the question. That really shows how complicated it is. I mean, this, this, brings, in, uh, this brings in the additional uh, the problem of, uh, of how one can determine uh, what the reference of a term is, uh, because ultimately, as you know, the problem comes home to the background language, and then the problem obviously can't be just solved by saying, well, one uses the background language because the philosophical problem remains, what is the connection between the background language and the world? So that there, there's the general problem of what I will call the representational character of language, which is one of the central themes in these lectures, representational character of language. And then there's the problem of determining um, what specifically the, ref the representational character of a given term is. And this is Quine's problem of translational indeterminacy. Now, uh, we can, as you know, we, we can, uh, we can uh, argue you know, uh, 40 days and 40 nights, uh, uh, and we all have. Uh, as to A, what there really is to Quine's worries about translational indeterminacy. I mean, this is still, this is still, up, for, um, this is still up for grabs uh, because, um, uh, as you know, the problem is to what extent is there any more indeterminacy here than there is in uh, any, uh, any empirical theory. So uh, I would have to indicate, first of all, that, I'm, that I do not agree with Quine that there is the problem of translational indeterminacy. And then I could uh, indulge in sort of Quine exegetics and to see uh, what the relationship would be in his views between in translational indeterminacy and the problem of reference. But his problem is not my problem. My problem is the general problem of how does language hook up with the world, you see. And uh, his problem is, in what specific way is what hooking up with what? You might say his problem is a problem that works, it's a more specific problem which works within the general framework of my problem. So he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't seek to avoid the problem, he just doesn't deal with it. I was thinking that this uh, really amounts to a piece of actual avoiding it. But the background language that Klein is always regressing into, uh, taking your alternatives, uh, I would guess essentially A to the Uh I'm sorry, but that's not right. But, 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 but he is at any rate explaining the existential quantification in the background language which is which is ordinary English. Yeah, but as I said, uh, uh Yeah, but the well, I know, but still uh, the the question can still legitimately be raised about the background language. I mean, he had been, uh, somebody once escaped Bradley's regress by saying, well, I stop here.
Yes. I wonder if you've got on the board there, Jones is somehow dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Well, that suggests to me the incompleteness of it. Yeah, well, there I was, that, that was short for Jones is somehow and Smith oh. is that how. Yeah. I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, I put it, I, I read it, I mean, I, I spoke it as I did yes. that, yeah. but uh, I didn't write it down. Now, I was thinking, you know, like, Jones is somehow, to me, is those questions, somehow what? Yeah, I know. Jones is somehow he, an F. Right, now he I... Somehow normally comes in as an adjective. I know, and that's why I shouldn't have done that. And that was just, uh, that, those are the dots of laziness. <laughs> So you're taking somehow by itself. That's now. right. I'm, yes, I'm treating somehow uh, as um, uh, as a stand-in, you see, for uh, predicates like pale. Jones is pale, so Jones is somehow. It's uh, it's, if you will, the way in which we generalize from on the predicate side as opposed to generalizing on the subject side. There were really some folly going back. That's right. That's right. And. Uh, uh, so uh, I also had to remember that Jones is a professor and Smith is also a professor. And I said, Jones is a some sort and Smith is a that sort also. Now I'm going to be saying more about this uh, next time. I, I introduced them in order to raise the fascinating topic of hows which are going to, as you know, going to turn out to be Frege's concepts, which are not logical. And uh, uh, I will be indicating the patterns of argument which have been used to make this notion attractive. And uh, then I'll be suggesting an alternative. Yes? No, I think, uh, if, if someone just said to you, but you make your ontological commitments by what you quantify over, to be is to be the value of the bound variable, uh, are you objecting that that's not sufficiently explicated or that it's wrong? Yeah, well, what I'm saying is that, uh, that those who wish to so use uh, variables of quantification so that they are always to be interpreted as ranging over objects, that's legitimate. All, I, all I've done so far, because you don't, in, in philosophy you don't, prove things, premise, 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 conclusion, and so on. But what I did was to appeal to a principle of tol toleration, so to speak. You know, uh, Carnap introduced the term. Uh, uh, one should be permitted to, to try things out, to see how, how far one can carry them. And certainly, somebody uh, who, uh, who uh, feels that, that, that there is a meaningful form of quantification or generalization which doesn't if ipso facto involve a reference to objects, uh, should be given a chance to try it out. And that's exactly what we find, you see, in the line of thought that I've been sketching here. That we can, just as we can go from Tom is tall to something is tall, so we can go from Tom is tall to Tom is something. We can generalize in both ways. Now, uh, the classical assumption has been by virtue of the way in which uh, quantification theory has been developed, uh, you see, formally, that quantification always involves a range of objects for the variables. Now, the Fregian, of course, would want to say that uh, here we have a variable and a quantification, but it is not uh, uh, a variable which ranges over objects. Now, he, the Fregian is going to find a special kind of entity which it ranges over, which, he, which roughly are not objects. But then, uh, even apart from that, uh, there, are, uh, there are reasons to find it useful and uh, coherent to use the apparatus of quantification in connection with variables without interpreting it in such a way that the variable ranges over objects. Now, as I will indicate next time, there are two ways in which this can be done. One is the Fregian way of having it range over hows, and the other is by using substitutional quantification. So, uh, the issue, in, in a certain sense, the, the issue that you're all familiar with about objectual or, or substitutional quantification is lurking all around here. As a matter of fact, you'll remember 
The uh, first alternative, A2, which I gave, the, the, the second form of the first strategy was essentially the substitutional approach to the uh, uh, truth conditions for quantified statements. Only I carefully separate, I don't like to call it substitutional because that is a term from the theory of formal languages. And that involves the idea that you have a definite list of, of terms that you substitute and so on. You see, whereas I simply want to do pre it uh, and give the more general philosophical point. Remember the first alternative interpreted definite, in, indefinite reference in terms of definite reference by saying something is the lion is true if and only if some determinate reference to something, uh, uh, in some sentence making a determinate reference uh, to something uh, and classifies that as a lion is true. Yes? Well, that means that in the long run, carrying this line out, you took Tom is tall and got from that something is tall. Mm -hmm. That something will refer in the same sense to another either. Uh, it's not that Tom is something won't and something is tall. Will. Well, that is, uh, uh, I don't have a nice little formula to answer there, but I, I will say this, you're, you're warm. <laughs> <laughs> you're warm because that is, again, the problem of the relation of, of something to the world. Uh, but uh, again, there, there's no, I'm sure, I assure you, there's no simple way in which I can uh, unburden myself <laughs> on that. Yes? I don't know this would be better asked tomorrow or today, but would you care to comment on the suggestion that Frege doesn't have variable ranging at all? In fact, they don't range. Rather, we have to have a higher level of predication. I, I will want to comment on that tomorrow, because I'm not, I'm not at this moment concerned actually with Frege himself, but with uh, variations on Fregean themes. This would be an alternative uh, approach entirely different. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes? You were careful to distinguish between somehow it's one word and somehow it's two words. Mm -hmm. Would you also care to do it for that how? Yes. One word? Yeah. Or would you want to say something like that somehow? No. No, no. The, the, you see, a variable, the role done in ordinary language, which is done by a variable, is that of cross-reference, you might say. I mean, as Quine and standard logic say, the variable uh, comes out in, for example, for some x, uh, X is a tiger and X is tame, you see, uh, the second X also is doing the job of it, in other words, referring back. Uh, uh, and so that job is done in ordinary language by words like, uh, and it is, or that is, and so on. So the, that how is intended to refer back to the, uh, the <coughs> word somehow, which governs the whole context. And is, in a way, it refers back to the somehow, grammatically, as the uh, as the second x does to the first x in the quantified formulation in the standard logistical notation. So it's spelled this one word. That yeah, that's how it's spelled. Right. Well, I think we might. Oh yes, you've tied up uh, the word something or with uh, the Latin word aliquid. Mm -hmm. You pointed out that ali aliquid likewise is uh, arranges over everything in some respect, has some such universality. Mm -hmm. I, I want, was wondering just how uh, specific your reference to, to that aliquid was. That is, uh, you're aware that in Aquinas and others, aliquid is rendered as something like uh, an other thing, aliud. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's supposed to bring out the idea of uh, of diversity in some way, mm -hmm. an entity diverse from other entities. Right. Now, it wasn't clear to me whether uh, your reference to something likewise was intended to bring out that aspect of no, diversity. No, that would have been much more like the, thing, I think, uh, aliquid is a word that was handled in different ways in different by different medieval logicians. And to handle it in that way, see, there are two themes that come in. <coughs> One is its trans-category character. And that's the theme I've been stressing with the something and somehow here. And the other, the other theme is, uh, the, is the theme of reference. And there is exactly where one has that temptation 
to break it up into uh, some thing as opposed to another thing. And third, see, I would then be uh, expressing a slight anxiety when Aquinas uh, makes that particular move, which I don't think he needed to make, and I don't think needs to be made in order to stress uh, the character of Aliquid as a transcendental. Yeah. So you wouldn't be going along with his also the use of the word race, R-E-S, as another right. transcendental, which seems to have an objectual right. Uh, aspect. Right. 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 But I think this, this is a fascinating topic. I simply uh, threw it in because it, uh, the medieval logicians did have this, and the going back to Aristotle, you can face it there, did have this concept of the transcendental. So, some way of, uh, uh, some mode of, shall we say, of reference in some very broad sense, which transcends the distinction between the categories. And in this term, in these terms here, that means that it plays different grammatical roles. And then we want to examine what, this, what the significance of these different grammatical roles is for problems of reference, and problems of the relation of language to the world, which is the basic problem which I want to discuss in these lectures. How does language, and of course, ultimately thought, uh, connect up with the world? Well, I think that will, uh, I think my, what's that? Mr. I'm sure that this question will uh, be relevant, uh, doubly relevant next time. Maybe <laughs> 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 <laughs>